You are listening to the Children of Film Podcast. We're a 1.5 hour long dick joke. Hello and welcome back. I am your host, Jacob, and here is... Gotta be more dynamic than that, man. You can't be like, hello, welcome back. Be like, hello, welcome back. Here is your other host, Jaren, and the two of us form the team up. We are partners in crime. We are children of film, but don't worry, we just love film. Oh, that's a good one, man. Uh, yeah, better? thank you for having me. This is episode 20, Jacob. Big <laughs> Thank you for screen. having me. We do we do this together every <laughs> week. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I don't know. Just, oh, you know, are you? Yeah, <laughs> silly. Me with my blunders. Yeah, I'm the only one making mistakes here. It's not like this is our second recording or anything. I'm the I only accidentally one, yeah. introduced myself as Jaren, so uh, we have to stack <laughs> that one. But, no, we should have just kept it. No, we're back. Uh, yeah, like we said, episode 20. This is a special episode. We're trying to think of something special to do, but we couldn't think of uh, anything that huge because it's a slow news week. But we today we are doing an interesting top five, just like we did last time. Both both ambitious top fives. But, you know, we love it. And uh, we're going to do the show as normal. Jacob, should we get started yeah, with um, our diary display? I'll just say, sorry, our last week's episode was a bit late. And uh, as of right now, it's still not uploaded as of while we're recording this. I've just been a little busy this week, and uh, I will admit that I forgot to upload it uh but uh yeah so this is probably coming not too long after the other one but uh yeah we'll get onto our diary display let's see if we can keep today's show under an hour let's try i doubt it but you know we'll try you you'll know if we failed or not right now because i want to at it but we i want to go i want to go watch better call soul so let's get it done it's a great um episode. diary display i'll start this week uh just the movies we've been watching lately uh not much, because it hasn't been long since we last recorded the other one. I watched another Netflix documentary from this year, Get Me Roger Stone, and it's about the guy... <coughs> you may not know his name, but you might be familiar with his work, and he's the it's guy Stone, who was kind of... the name? Yeah, Roger Stone. Um, but he's the guy <laughs> yeah, who's behind... Too, so just jump in after. Yeah, he's the guy who's behind Trump's sort of presidential campaign, and he's been a political consultant in Washington since the Nixon days. He's good friends with uh, Nixon, and uh, he uses dirty, underhanded tactics, and uh, he's, a, he's a great villain, but what I like... Like, he's a pretty, like, bad dude, but he doesn't give a fuck either, and the movie does well to be unbiased, I thought. Yeah, I agree too. Like I am I'm not on this guy's side. I'm a get, like you know, I think yeah. I don't condone the the shit he's doing, but as I really like that this documentary was impartial because it so could have easily been like, oh, he's the fucking devil, you know, and very very, you know, but it it really just presents it and it shows the guy for who he who he is and how he sees himself and really it's just an interesting study on this, you know, uh truth is greater than fiction character. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's yeah, he's a really interesting person in real life, especially at the end. They're like, "What do you have to say for the people who might loathe you after this documentary is finished?" And he's like, "He's like, I hope you hate me because if I hate you, it means I'm effective." And he's like, and he walks away, and he just he's just like, yeah, he does not give a fuck. He's yeah, pretty interesting guy. Yeah, so that's yeah, a good that documentary. Three and a half out of five, decent documentary. Yeah. Same. Uh, I watched. Uh, I ordered another bunch of Blu-rays, so they're starting to come through now. And I watched Falling Down with. Uh, Michael Douglas, and probably might be the only good film Joel Schumacher has ever directed. Uh, but I was, I've just been interested in this movie because I've been familiar with like the breakfast scene in the burger joint where like he just goes on a bit of a rampage because uh, they wouldn't serve him breakfast like two minutes after eleven thirty. But he's like this sort of uh, he is you know he's wearing his button up shirt and his tie and uh, he's got his briefcase and he's. It starts in his car, but eventually he just kind of snaps. And, you know, you learn more about why his character snaps. But he kind of goes on this violent rampage through New York, just on a crusade for the truth. But, um, yeah, it was a really, really... It's darkly funny, and a great, great performance from Michael Douglas is why you watch it. It doesn't always work. Some of the dialogue is very, very 90s, and it kind of is cringeworthy at times but for the most part it is a pretty fun movie and just a really really entertaining concept um i watched the great wall catching up on 2017 films uh with matt damon and i honestly i watched it like two days ago and i don't remember anything from it it's like they fight monsters (laughs) matt damon's in a man bun and the cgi was kind of questionable 
he has his mate, and then at the end, they he like swings around a big tower and shoots uh, the horde yeah, he like, after their shields go up. He like came out of the 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 tower on like a zip line or some shit, and then he bombed all the <laughs> creatures. And I really did not like this movie at all. And as most people uh, like, unlike most people, I don't care about your whitewashing. That's not why I hated it. I hated it because it's fucking boring. Uh, all right, I watched. Hounds of Love, a 2017 movie. It's an Australian movie, and fuck me dead, it was good. Uh, it's a kidnapping movie. There have been so many of those the last few days, but um, it's really, really dark. And so many, do you mean two? Yeah, well, and last year, 10 Cloverfield Lane, you had <laughs> fucking the Room. Last days, was it? You no had bad, Room. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that was the last couple years, days. Too. Years, years, years. Um... Pretty sure I meant to say years, um, if I didn't say that. But yeah, Hounds of Love. Uh, why do Australians make such dark movies? It's amazing. Seriously, 90% of them are just real fucked up crime films. But it's about this murderous couple played by Emma Booth and Stephen Curry. And they kidnap... It's set in Perth in the 1980s. You're stomping ground, Jaron. Um, not you weren't there in the 80s, but you are there now. Um, hey, yeah. In spirit. Yeah, it's set in Perth. There are a lot of good films coming out of Perth, but um, I'm all over the place here. But yeah, this couple, they kidnap this teenage girl and keep her there. And uh, this movie, it takes a familiar premise. It's the director's debut, Ben Young. And it takes this familiar premise and sort of turns it into a few things. It's a fucked up love story and it's a power struggle between those three people because the girl who's been kidnapped kind of... Her only way to try and survive is to try and drive a wedge between this couple because they have their own issues and it's a story about abusive relationships and how powerful manipulation can be but what I liked is that this movie is incredibly dark and incredibly disturbed but it's not torture porn all the violence is implied until the very end no, no physical violence or anything is uh, shown on screen despite the fact that a lot of it is happening and uh, it's just really intense there were moments here I caught myself like holding my breath and, uh, yeah, it, it was really, really damn good. I highly recommend it. Um, if you want to dip your toes into some more Australian films, uh, I watched The Room, the greatest bad movie of all time. I'd never seen it before. I had to watch it one day, eventually. Um, it's f fucking hilarious. Like, you'd think, oh, you know, after we've heard about it, am I just going to watch it and sit there and be bored? No, it is genuinely that funny, and I can see myself watching this again and again. Um, it is atrocious. It, but it's, god damn it, it's the best kind of atrocious. And today I watched our film swap, and that's it. Short one today. Yeah, I definitely have to see The Room before I see The Disaster Artist. And I will do that eventually. I just don't really want to at the moment. Uh, it's I so funny, dude. I watched the other week. A comedy, yeah, I, can, I, I know it's going to be. But um, I'd just rather watch something good. We should like watch it together week. over Rabbit or something. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, we should, well you just watched it, do you even want to watch do it, it Do a commentary on it for the podcast or something. Yeah. Do you want to watch it again? Not immediately, but... Yeah. G give it a few um, weeks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so I watched Fist Fight, a comedy, a 2017 comedy you watched a while ago, and like you said, Charlie Day... By a while ago, you up. mean last week? Yes, exactly. Uh, and you know, it was fine, um, I thought there was a few funny moments... Uh, especially with, like you said, Charlie Day's character. Uh, and like you said as well, Ice Cube is just Ice Cube. He's just there to... He, I mean, he fits the role perfectly. Uh, he's basically black J.K. Simmons. Um, and nice yeah, one. I, I did really like it. Thanks, man. Um, Gillian Bell is in this. Not really a big fan of her, <laughs> but, you know... Mm, she's she fine. was okay in this, but she was, re she was yeah. really one joke for the whole movie. Yeah, but ah, I want to sleep did, with the students. But to be fair, I did find that joke pretty funny when he's I, always like, it, he's just, it wasn't when too he's bad. like, he's like, get the fuck away from me. She's like, she's, he's just playing games. I thought that was pretty. And I like I that. Know. Um, in a lot of those comedies, there would just be that character like that, and no one really acknowledges it. It's just something that happens. But yeah. there's a point where Charlie Day just goes, shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah, and he's and he talk, he questions her a lot. He's like, that's illegal. <laughs> you can't do that. And she's like, yeah, well, I mean, is it? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, huh. Uh, I watched Get Me Roger Stone, like you said, uh, three and a half out of five. I watched a documentary, You Really Love the Mars Generation, and you're right, it's really, really good. I really uh, gravitated towards it. I thought it was really interesting. All the kids in it were really likable. And it again, it's just really interesting to, you know, it's a movie, it's a, uh, it tells us about, you know, how we, uh, what happened in the 70s, why we've stopped, uh, space has stopped becoming a big thing. And um, if we can shift it back up into gear, we could be on Mars soon. We could be colonizing it soon. 
um, and I did really enjoy it, so I gave that a 4 out of 5. I watched, uh, it's a little known TV movie, The Courageous Heart of Irene Sendler. Never heard um, of that one. And, yeah, it, The Courageous Heart of Irene Sendler, and it was actually really good. Um, it's about the true story of Irene Sendler set in, uh, the 1940s. Who's in it? Played by Anna, played by Anna Paquin. Oh. And she, it's, it's a pretty short one, um, and it's pretty good, and she basically just, um... Uh, she smuggled to, I think it was 2,000 Jewish kids um, out of the city um, to safety underneath uh, all the, while uh, in occupied Poland, while all the Germans were walking around. She kind of smuggled them out, and she's, you know, she's a real-life hero, and it's kind of good to watch that. I watched the 2017 movie Mindhorn, and I actually gave it a three and a half out of five. I thought it was really enjoyable. It was real funny. Um, it, you know, a really great central performance, uh, and it's just a send up of that old. Uh, yeah, Dota's play uh, is just genre. going through everything I talked about last week, basically. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> Boss Baby, a 2017. Oh no, movie. no, you watched it. Well, it's got like 60 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, sick and fuck. I've actually seen a lot of people on Facebook say like, "Oh, it's not bad." I watched a couple uh, Collider videos today, and some chicks like, "Stop bagging on it; it's not bad." And I tell you what. Jaren, that is it's bad. That, that is not going to help reinforce our assertion that we just love film. Yeah, no, it won't. <laughs> uh, but I watched it because you know it, the main character is a babe. No, <laughs> I watched it because I'm trying to build up my 2017 numbers, and you know it was fine. You know, uh, I I, was, I I feel like I've seen all the porn on the internet. I wanted something new. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, something new. Just you know, it's 80 minutes, so I was like, I'll just quickly flog one out and watch something. No, um. Uh, I watched our film swap we'll talk about later. Uh, I watched a movie, The Purge, simply because I'm interested in the premise. I think it's really cool. It is uh, a great it's premise. Got, yeah, it is a great premise. It's got people I really like in it. Ethan Hawke's a great actor, one of my favourites. Lena Headey is in it from Game of Thrones. She's really good. Shame. And the first half is really good. I really enjoy the first half. And then it just develve, delves into just madness and stupidity. And the ending's just terrible. Like, really, like, far-fetched. Like, it actually started really grounded, and, like, this is how it would be if this happened, and then it just gets nuts. And then, um, apparently the second... Yeah, let's get nuts. Apparently the second one's actually good, and the second one's actually a lot better. Because in the first one, he didn't didn't have the budget. Like, the director was like, if this one makes a lot of money, then I'm gonna make... The second one is gonna be, like, Escape New York, but The Purge. This one is just gonna be isolated in one house. And, uh, it blew up, and he got to make his second one. Apparently it's a lot better, so watch that. And people said the third one was good, too, so... Yeah, I heard that, too. Well, the the last one... I haven't seen any of them. Yeah, Yeah, this is the first time watching it. Uh, and the last film, uh, Jacob. Jacob. I'm not hijacking this plane. I'm trying to save it. Um, non I watched stop. Liam Neeson's non stop. No, it's that other film where he says You and you and I know neither of us was ever gonna get off this podcast alive. Yeah. <laughs> we were <laughs> I watched this, this is one of the first movies I watched back in, oh no it wasn't, this is back in 2014, not 2013, uh, but no, I really, uh, you know, uh, when we saw this back in 2014, we both really loved it, uh, and I uh, watched it again, like, sh- a few months after when I bought it on DVD, and didn't really like it as much, it didn't hold up, and so it's been about three years since I've watched it, and it's still dumb fun, I still enjoy it, um, I completely forgot about the whole aspect of his daughter, and the disease, and how his daughter died when she was eight years old, and when I heard that, I was like, oh shit, right? Right, yeah, that's pretty good. And his um, whole speech about how he's not a good man and he wasn't a good father, but he just wants to save the plane. I don't know, it just got me. I don't know, it just, I, I'd really gravitate towards him. I think it's really good. It's Die Hard on a Plane. Um, you know, it's not original or anything, but I, and the, the, the direction by Joel Makalet Serra, he really stamps his style. Like, some of these shots are I really love his great. style. And yeah, no. it is really cool to have yeah. a condensed movie that pretty much the whole thing just takes place on a a plane bar the first 10 minutes. Liam Neeson's his muse, isn't he? Yes, he is. Liam Neeson's like Liam yeah. Neeson just gets his movies made. Like he But would, no, if you never saw if, if you never saw Nonstop, I actually recommend it because it is really really fun. I don't know if it has a lot of replay value. I've only watched it a couple times, but the first time you watch it, it's really like you you do get into the mystery of it. Yeah, and uh, he actually Jomay actually started the whole um Hey, maybe you may whatever the whole yeah. text up on the screen thing. <laughs> yeah, if someone's getting a text message, everyone's just yeah. used it since then. All right, so that is we've kept it That's fourteen, just under fifteen minutes. That's so our shortest one in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's incredible. Um, yeah, so let's move on to diary display, and we're going to go into. Don't you mean move on to news? You've got a point, Jacob. Let's move on to the bloody. Yeah. First up, gym. in news something that has my dick hard. Um, 
it's just throbbing with anticipation, Jaron. And uh, it's that BFFs, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, are doing a new movie together. And they've started a production company called Stolen Picture. And their first project has been billed as a comedy called The Slaughterhouse Rules. And I've just read the plot just now, and it looks really cool. Uh, yeah, it says it, it takes place in a boarding school where a sadistic posse of sixth formers, who are like, you know, high school seniors, basically. I know that because I watched the in-betweeners. Uh, terrorizes <laughs> the students Great until shit. a site opens up a sinkhole on the school grounds. From that sinkhole emerges an ancient evil, turning the school's pecking order upside down, pitting teachers against students in a bloody battle for survival. Now, that sounds like some Cornetto trilogy shit, doesn't it? Oh, it sounds just... Yeah, exactly. I I cannot wait for this. It just looks so <coughs> excited. I mean, obviously, uh, Ka- uh, Nick and Simon are used to being uh, behind... I mean, in front of the camera, and this one, they're going to be behind it. But Simon, Simon wrote them but, all, so he co-wrote them but, all, so, you know, it's still got yeah, that touch. Exactly. Exactly, uh, and hopefully... I oh, bet he didn't write this one. This one is written and directed by Crispin Mills. He's a singer. He did Fantastic Fear of Everything. Oh, I didn't know that. A, I didn't know I had a director. A, yeah, uh, it's by. It's already been written, and it's by Crispin Fantastic Mills. Fantastic Fear um, of Everything. It's not... Yeah, it's Fuck. not... Fuck. Well, for, like, I've, I've seen it, and I think it's not that bad. I, I like Fantastic Fear of Everything. I own it on DVD, actually. I bought it for, like, $4. I haven't seen um, it. I just heard it's it, terrible. I've watched it a, no, I've watched it a couple of times. It's not that. It's got like forty percent. It's not that great. It's mm. fine. Um, Why isn't Simon, Simon writing it? That it. sucks. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I mean, oh. dude, Simon Pegg and Nick are fucking smart lads, and they're not gonna start off their production company with a dud. This they well, know this is gonna. The be amount good. of duds Simon does star in, you never know. <laughs> oh god, yeah, but I mean. Oh, I was about to say Nick isn't, but I mean Nick's in a fucking ton of duds too. Isn't one? Oh, of the they're worst both they're both in a lot of duds. Yeah, uh, but Simon Pegg's also, you know, Mission Impossible, uh, Star Trek. I want to see him work. I um, want to see but, him you know, work I, with a director like Joe Cornish, who did Attack the Block. Like someone I like see that him would work be cool. with a director like Edgar Wright. <laughs> yeah, well, he's fucking busy <laughs> now. But let's see if Simon Pegg can do one. Hope maybe Edgar Wright will do a <clears> film <throat> under their label. That'd be cool. But one no, day. I don't. I don't see them starting off their label with a dud. I think they'll they'll know that they need Please to start off good. Please God. Um, but yeah, hearing and, about yeah, hearing that it. Simon isn't even writing it is kind of worrying to me. Yeah, I agree. It is uh, real worrying. But um, hopefully they'll... I mean, uh, like I was saying, they're usually in front of the camera. This time they'll be service producers. you got to think they'd have a cameo in there somewhere. Fucking Facebook browser ads. Go away. Yeah, that just... Jesus Christ. I'm trying to look up news articles and you're giving me that shit. Uh, all right. <laughs> anyway, um... Should we move on? Uh, we've got a fair bit of news today, so we'll start going through it. Hackers have... Uh, Hackers are holding Disney for ransom over the new Pirates of the Caribbean movie. They've, uh, it's been hacked, which happens probably all the time in this digital age. But um, they've stolen the movie, and I think, the, what are they saying? That they're going to like release 20 minutes of it every time Disney don't comply with their demands yeah, or some shit? Um, I don't really yeah, know what so their demands is, are, but... Well, th- this is the same thing that happened with... Well, they want money. Um, this is the same thing that happened with Orange is the New Black and Netflix at the start of the year, um, and Netflix would not negotiate with them because they're basically cyber terrorists they wouldn't negotiate with them because it's not their policy so they released like the first 10 episodes and there's only 12 or 13 in the season um and so they're doing the same thing again which is and it's like disney the biggest movie company out there it's crazy how they got their hands on this when the story first came out no one knew what movie it was it was unknown imagine if they got star wars oh god dude (laughs) That would they would probably scared. give in yeah. if they got Star Wars. I mean, I'm glad because this or Cars Three is probably the Disney films I least care about. But still, um, I, I mean, ju- I mean, even if I don't care about the film, just on policy, I don't care for pirating films, and I don't think you should be like you don't fuck with film, you don't hold films hostage. That's where that's where I live. You don't fuck with that. You don't and shit that where really I live. Sucks. Exactly. I don't. You don't shit where I live. And I really hope that um they get the film back. But uh, it looks Jaren, like you don't eat while well you shit or shit while well you eat. Whatever. The smell is bad. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's your uh, don't mess with the Zohan quote for the day. Yeah, <laughs> that we filled our daily quota with one don't mess with Zohan quote. Oh, All right. God, I can't Moving on. Just reference that. But uh, yeah, hopefully they get it back. All right. Next piece of news. 
Oh, I'll do it. All right. Zach Efron has signed on <laughs> to play serial killer Ted Bundy in a new movie. Uh, it's been reported that the movie is going to be called Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile, which is a fucking cool title. That is and it will awesome center title. on Bundy's relationship with his girlfriend. And uh, it's been directed by a documentary filmmaker, Joe Berlinger. Um, he's best known for a series of documentaries called Paradise Lost, but he also directed Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows. So there's that mm. um, spanner in the works, but... um. You know, if yeah, you know Ted Bundy, uh, he he loved kill. He dabbled in a bit of the old woman killing, and uh, so you know we'll get a. And I think this is a gr- great role for Efron if they don't fuck the movie up. Yeah, he's a woman <laughs> killer connoisseur, and it's weird that he's picked for Ted Bundy. I mean, I love it because I think the dude's got great chops. He just needs a better agent. Hopefully, it's the start of something new. But I mean, Ted Bundy's like a skinny fella. Like this is all. Yeah, weird. Zac Efron's weird. a monster. Yeah, Zac, Zac Efron looks like... Oh, uh, it'd be cool to legs. see him lose a bit of weight for it. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. I mean, Lo- I don't... Know I don't know. I don't know if he... He's great. probably got a clause in his contract that he has to be buff and he has to have at least one shirtless scene. He has so, to like, there'll be one scene, scene where, he, where, he's ki- like, where he's killing someone and he'll be, like, flexing his muscles while yeah. he's strangling her or something. <laughs> It's like the it's like the clause in Vin Diesel's contracts with Fast and Furious that he has to... He can never lose a fight in a movie. Do you know but, that? Wait, yeah, he's never yeah, allowed yeah, to yeah, lose I a fist fight. That. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't really, he didn't really get along with the Rock on the set. I think we've mentioned that before, anyway. But I just uh, think I'm um, on the site. I'm looking at for this, uh, yeah, Zac Efron story. There's a, a side story that came up on the page about Taylor Swift's new man. Should we talk about that? Oh shit, yeah. I mean, why are we talking about film when we can talk about Taylor Swift? With an English actor, and I'm not going to go ahead and click on the article to find out who it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, moving on uh, to more movie news. One. Jimmy Kimmel is going to host the Oscars again, and that's fucking awesome because he did a great job. I am so happy with this. I mean, I mean, I don't think Jimmy Fallon's ever going to get a hosting gig again because oh, he America was awful. finally... I've known it for years, but America finally have realised <laughs> how unfunny he is. He fake has no laugh. improv skills. That's a fake laugh. Jimmy Fallon, it's real. No. Yeah. Uh, um, it's just, you know, he's, he's got no improv skills. He's just not good. But oh, Jimmy Jaren. Kimmel's so damn funny. Jaren, Jaren. Yeah. Chastain yeah. in the red main. Chastain in the red main. Uh, fuck, he's say, good. Fuck, I... <laughs> no, I uh, that, that's him improvising when he doesn't have a card to read off, and that's... We're, we're, <laughs> it's um, a, it's the scary. The show business deserves better than that. This is this, the night this, of This night is Trump's America, don't. people. Jimmy Fallon <laughs> hosting the Oscars. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that sounds like anarchy to me. Um, I'd probably start World War Three because he's just shit. Uh, but Jimmy Kimmel's so damn funny, and he's I'm really glad. I mean Jimmy <coughs> Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Conan, uh, uh, McFarlane, or um, Jimmy Ricky Gervais are my tri- uh, my, my four picks for hosting the Oscars. I like the offensive humor, I so I enjoyed yeah. McFarlane's. We saw yeah, your boobs. So we saw your boobs. <laughs> I mean, he could do so that so much with that now after the fappening came out and all these leaks. Got <laughs> Jennifer out. Lawrence, like, we haven't seen your boobs at all. Oh and wait, Jennifer Lawrence, we saw them on our phones. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I'm really excited for this, and uh, hopefully, you know, there won't be an, um, like Trump jokes to overshadow his sketch. And uh, I mean, it sucks because his biggest joke he said didn't even uh, happen because of the mix up with La La Land and Moonlight. Um, ah. So his big his his end joke. Um, didn't even happen, so he was kind of robbed a little. What was it going to be? He, took, he was robbed worse uh, than La La Land. It was. Yeah, <laughs> it was going to be him and Damon again. It was going to be a big oh, joke with Damon, and which really sucks. Um, he said that they had planned it for. Yeah, they had they'd planned it since he was um uh told he was going to do it. Like should have said uh, the winner is Manchester by the Sea. Get Matt Damon up there. Yeah. Oh wait, there's been a mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, it's, and he's, he's got a, and, um, you know, he took that on the chin and on the night. He was like, oh, no, he did very well. Fault. Yeah, he did great. Um, you know, some people would have just run away and just kind of not wanted to be involved in that, but he did great. And so it's great that he, um, he won't be overshadowed this time as long as they've. And yeah, it's cool that they brought him right. back. Cause I think at the end he was like, this is the last time I will host the Oscars. And, yeah. like, <laughs> and when <laughs> no, he got the cool. uh, job this time, he, he released a press statement. He's like, if you think I screwed the last Oscars <laughs> night, just wait till what I have planned for the 90th Academy Awards. They need a, uh, they need a hire Shyamalan as a writer for some of their sketches oh. and shit. Oh yeah, just like the biggest twist <coughs> ever. Like I'm um, South Park. What, what should we do, Shyamalan? Well, what if it was never actually there? No, that's not a plan. That's a twist. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
God damn, is Mel, Gib Mel Gibson's a crazy son of a bitch, but god damn, does he know story structure. Um, let's. What if we got, like, a submarine, and we went deep sea diving? <laughs> oh no, that's just quote. pushing the limits. So that's just pushing the human limits. That's 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 not a plan, James Cameron. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move on, on to our, film our next segment. We're making pretty yeah, good time. Segment, I like it. If you're new to us, we say it every week. If you're new, which it, maybe one person is, half a person, uh, it's a segment we do every week where I give him, we give each other films we've been begging the person to watch for a while, and now they have to watch it. Uh, and in this case, I've given Jacob a film that I watched for the first time a couple months ago, and I loved it. It's by one of my favorite directors. It's got one of my favorite actors in it. That will be the combination of Scorsese, De Niro, and this is Casino, Jacob. So, Jaron, imagine yes. Goodfellas had unprotected sex with a better movie. That's <laughs> Casino. That's Casino. Fa Jacob famously... Doesn't like Goodfellas. I like Goodfellas. <laughs> I just, I just don't said love that it. To set you off. I just said. I just said that to set you off. But no, he, he doesn't. It's it's all right. <laughs> Cas Casino is Goodfellas, but with characters you care about and zero portions where I was struggling to stay awake because this movie is also like three, hours. three hours. Yeah, man. I was. I was in it, man. Yeah, I was fucking with it. It's uh, a it's big like a comedy epic. almost. It, it, it's yeah. a yeah, it's a big epic. You got Robert De Niro as uh, Ace. What was his last name? Goldstein, something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's he's uh, Rothstein, you know, he I think. Yeah, yeah, prob yeah. I think it is Rothstein. He's uh, got ties with the mob. Uh, his childhood best friend was Joe Pesci, who plays Nicky, and Ni he's Nicky is still very much involved with the mob. And uh, De Niro, uh, one thing leads to another, and he gets a job managing the Tangiers, one of the biggest casinos in Vegas. And f the first half of the movie is a big sort of look at how the underbelly of Vegas was controlled by the mobsters and all the casinos and shit like that and just how it all works the stuff on how you know they caught people cheating and the methods people used and stuff we see you know all the backroom deals and how there are these guys who don't even live in Vegas that are getting bags of money sent to them because they allow these people to win it's a whole intricate thing everybody's profiting off of somebody and it's pretty crazy and you know it's about how they make money with the casinos I'm going in circles here but anyway it, it evolves there's a bit of a power struggle between uh, De Niro and Pesci and Pesci's amazing dude just I, I could just listen to a whole movie where it's just him saying the word motherfucker the yeah. whole time <laughs> <laughs> he's so good oh man uh, you know um, Pesci was a they, uh, when when he hired Pesci for um, Raging Bull and then Goodfellas, they the cause the uh, producers didn't want him. They said he was a you know he was a lost cause. He couldn't act. They were like, no, he's going to drive away audiences. Don't don't get him. And Scorsese like, no, he's, he's terrific. Just let me just let me use him. And now yeah, b back in nineteen ninety not now but back in nineteen ninety five, they're like, oh, use Joe Pesci, use Joe Pesci, he'll be great. Yeah, and I'm glad they did because. The this is a powerhouse trio of performances from those two, and Sharon Stone, who's amazing. Um, but she plays sort of a typical character that is in a lot of these movies. You know, the gangster's wife, she struggles with drug addictions and stuff. Like, I f feel like I've seen that before, but she was a good character and well-developed. Um, but this movie is basically the exact same as Goodfellas and The Wolf of Wall Street, which isn't really a bad thing, you know. Scorsese has cornered the market on three-hour epics about the rise and fall of a person gen typically involved in criminal enterprise and there's always a montage in the third act of everyone being brought down by the feds um so yeah they, there are a lot of similarities between them but the plots are completely different in the subject matter i mean this is pretty similar to goodfellas but long story short i enjoyed the fuck out of casino i held my interest for the entire runtime the performances are great the, there's so many awesome soundtrack choices and scorsese is just the god he's the goat he's the goat um, so yeah, that's Casino. Um, need to watch some more Scorsese flicks. Uh, Jaron, I, I gave my. Uh, oh yeah, I haven't uh, ranked my directors, but I mean, he'd de he'd definitely be in my he'd, top five, man. Yeah, I he'd be up him. there for me. He's the, he's the man. Um, he's an extremely high batting average for me oh, in terms yeah, of man. like Goodfellas is my least favorite of his, and I still like that movie. And that's still three point um, five, so that's that's nuts. So yeah, I gave you for your film swap. Uh, 
I think we briefly mentioned it last week, maybe, but uh, the end of the tour because I was I thought Jaron had seen this, but it turns out he hadn't. It came out a couple years ago, and it's uh, Jason Siegel plays. Uh, you can say the plot, but I know you're a big Jason Siegel guy, and this is his career best performance, and he's incredible, like just about award worthy in this. So I knew you would probably like it. Hopefully, Jaron. Uh, so the end of the tour is, uh, like you said, uh, it is a movie I've been wanting to watch for a long time. I remember downloading it and getting ready to watch it once. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, no, I, I rented it from the DVD store back when it came out, uh, but it didn't work, and then uh, it, it was skipping because the last person that is had renting it, it from the DVD code store the code for downloading. No, I actually did, but someone had spilt coke on the disc and it didn't work. So then I downloaded it and that didn't work either and I just kind of gave up and I never went back to it. Uh, but I am a huge Jason Segel guy and a Jesse Eisenberg guy. I really enjoy Jesse Eisenberg if he's not in Batman vs Superman. He's um, a great actor and I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, so I was, so straight away this is the story of real life novelist David Foster Wallace. He came to fame when, uh, he, in 1996 I think, he produced his novel Infinite Jest. Um, which is a thousand pages, which was unheard of, and the the Infinite Jest is a it's actually a book about a, a tennis player. Tennis academy, and there's, there's a lot of shit. Near, uh, I don't know if I'd ever asylum. have the stamina to read it. <laughs> God no, but apparently it's fucking terrific, and it's so good that Jesse Eisenberg, who works for Rolling Stone, is compelled to go interview him, even though they haven't interviewed an author in forty years, because he said he's like, you know, this guy is going to be the. Um, uh, the uh, what's his name with the F in the middle? They say in Ted Two, F Again. Scott Fitzgerald. F Scott Fitzgerald of our time. Yeah, what does the F <laughs> stand for? It's got to be fuck. Um, <laughs> different, much different movie. Um, and the end of the tour. So uh, the whole movie is basically a road trip movie. And it, like, imagine the best conversation you've ever had with someone about life and about depression and this is this movie it really feels like somewhat of a link later movie because the whole thing is just conversations with Jesse Eisenberg interviewing Jason Siegel and it really just explores humanity in this book and what's going on behind this guy's eyes like he's like I mean he's written the most popular book of all, uh, of all time at that point it was selling like crazy and you know everyone was loving him people he was people wanted his autograph these girls wanted to talk to him and you know, he's just really troubled, and even though he did like that, he's just a really troubled guy, and he's really insecure, and it was kind of hard to watch. It was really sad. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg plays the real-life guy, David Lipsky, and he was really great, but, I mean, damn, Jason Siegel as David Foster Wallace, man, was fucking incredible. Seriously, he's so good in that, and that's why I was so fucking mad at the Discovery, because I was so excited to see him in another dramatic role, and it fucking sucked. He was good in it, but yeah. Oh, it was okay, but it's like the director said, look as bored as possible, and he followed that direction. Yeah. But no, he was so uh, damn good in this. Uh, I can't remember the... Is the director James Ponsold? Big is Jimmy he, Ponsold. Did uh, did he do Spectacular Now and shit? Yeah, and I He did The Circle, too, though, um, which is getting shat on. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. Apparently it's... I mean, I'm still waiting for it to come out here. We still got like three weeks. Yeah. And I mean, no, the end of the tour is an understated, emotionally resonant film, which I was heavily invested in. And it ju it's just about the human condition, you know, and it's full of intimate direction, intelligent writing, and a pair of fantastic performances, especially from Jason Siegel. And I, that might have sounded a little bit robotic, but that was literally off the top of my head. And I love the end of the tour. A lot, and I'm giving it a four out of five. Uh, it was one of the better films I've seen this week, actually. Mm. Really get you, it. fuck machine. All right. Yeah. That's our film swap. We're making decent time. Now let's get into our top five, our last segment of the show. And uh, since we were talking about the Oscars earlier, what with uh, Kimmel hosting them and the old uh, Best Picture winner blunder, we are going to count down our top five favorite uh, Best Picture winners. Now... We haven't seen all the classics, as we, we just, well, I like to pre-warn people every week, because some people get oh, yeah. unusually touchy over top five lists, but I've only seen probably 30 out of the 90 or so, but um, it's a solid 30, so, um, you know, bear with us, and uh, spoilers, uh, you heard me review The Godfather the other week, it's not in my five. <laughs> Should I just warn people, every list we make, The Godfather's not there, I'm sorry. Best yeah, dual performances, uh, no Godfather, I'm sorry. Best I mean, animated ten, films. I mean, Just Marlon guys, Brando. be warned. There's no Godfather. Yeah, yeah, do it. Uh, oh, I mean, top five uh, films that came out in 2015. It could just go for a spot there, but I mean, just. All right. Um. So I'll start. I'll do a few honorable mentions. And my number five. Uh, 
So I'm just gonna do like five honorable mentions. So Gladiator, Ooh, one I watched recently. Mention. Russell Crowe is the man. Um, well deserved win, I'd say. Better performance in Beautiful Mind, but Gladiator is a much better film, and uh, it's fucking it's a good film. Jaron, are you not entertained? Million Dollar Baby. Uh, Clint Eastwood is the man. I love that movie. Uh, basically, all right, I'm gonna stop saying the man. Basically, everybody who is involved with these films is the man. Is so the you man. can just you know you can just everyone you in just these know lists that. is the man. Hillary just Swank, the fucking man. Hillary Swank is the man. All right. Other honorable mention, Silence of the Man. I mean, The Lambs. Yeah. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, by, uh, directed by Jonathan Demme, I believe, who died recently, sadly. Uh, stars, what, uh, you know it's It's a good fucking movie, is one what I'm saying. It's one that I watched for the first time this year, and uh, it's a good movie. Forrest Gum, that was one of the first films that really I loved when I was first getting into cinema, and uh, it's, I thought you Forrest know, Gump was in your top 50 of all time. Yeah, it is, but most of these are around the fringe. Um, and uh, you throw me off now, Jaron. You've thrown off my train of thought. And Spotlight yeah. is another honor- honourable mention. Not specifically, like, number six, but these are just my honourable mentions. And uh, Spotlight, I think, is one of the best ones in recent years. And uh, despite the fact that it wasn't my favourite in 2015, I thought it was a very, very well-deserved winner, unlike Moonlight. I love Moonlight, oh, but it, I was happy with Spotlight winning. Where over my favourite movie of that year, which was Room or Mad Max Fury Road. I'm rambling now. All right, my number five is another one that I watched for the first time this year, and it is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, I'm going to jump in here because it's my number five too. Oh, oh, oh big dick! Directed by Milos Foreman. more often than not, actually. It does. Of, Our fives like, are often seen, the like, same. It's completely different films. Like, of, yeah, it's just weird. Anyway. I've only seen two of his movies, the other ones, People vs. Larry Flynn, which was also pretty good. But this movie, it's oh, just, yeah. while I'm watching it, I wasn't sitting there like, oh, this is masterful and stuff. But then when it was over, it was just, it, it was just instantly in my head, I'm like, that's a perfect movie. That's a fucking five out of five movie. It's just, it left me in the feeling like, I just watched something great. Look at the, the ensemble cast. I don't know half the cunt's names, but they were all so good. It's Jack Nicholson in this mental institution, and everybody, you know, you feel sympathy for all these characters. Uh, Christopher Lloyd shows up there. Danny, Danny DeVito's DeVito, is in there. Louise Fletcher, yeah. William Redfield. Um, now you're just reading you the IMDb cast list. No, you, uh, actually, uh, Will Sampson... Sydney Lat, that's all I know. I don't know. Oh, Lat- Mel Lambert, Kay Lat- Lee, Mimi Sarkeesian, Lan Fenders, Delos V. Smith Jr., Muse Small, Louisa Moritz, Ted Markland. Um, Did yeah. you make them up? No, I'm reading that the fucking impressive. cast list. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost any dickhead. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, it's these mental patients and Jack Nicholson sort of comes in and he's not really crazy, he's just a criminal who's trying to go in there so he can escape. And he kind of sort of rallies them to start, you know, living life and to, to get tries to get this place to give them more joy and he ends up becoming sort of a really inspiring character and the ending is amazing and Jack Nicholson in this is one of the best performances I have ever seen. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, when you recommended me to watch this, I was like, yeah, it's been on my list for a long time. I'll just get it. I bought it on Blu-ray. I watched it. And it did floor me. I mean, like you said, he's uh, it's a mental asylum. All these people have their own certain issues, and all of these guys go through an arc, and they really learn something off Jack Nicholson's character. And it is really inspiring, and it's a, it's a really interesting take on the mental asylum slash prison genre. Like, it's not about gangs or killing people or beating each other up. It's just about him rallying people. And still, one to date, one of the best shots of all time, Time is when all of the, in my opinion, is when all of uh, the patients and Jack Nicholson are coming back on the boat and they've all yeah. got fish on the fishing rods and they're like, yeah, and the guys, <laughs> the guys on the dock are just like, oh god, that was it's awesome. amazing, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll rattle off my honorable mentions, then you go to your number four, I guess. Uh, uh, yep. uh, so my honorable mentions, I've got a lot that you said, like um, I've also got mm. Million Dollar Baby, Spotlight, Sons of the Lambs. Argo, which I really enjoy. I think that's quite underrated. No Country for Old Men. Chicago is one of my favorites. I love that musical. Uh, Birdman is really, really, really great. And then Just Godfather, missed my honorable mentions, that one. Godfather 1 and 2, respectively. I think I think they're both pretty much on par, but number 2 is just missing that central performance from... Um, Brando, even though it has got De Niro and Pacino split evenly, but um, no, it is. Uh, they're they're both really really great. Um, so you said the first one's the better. One more recently, uh, just but I think the second one's more entertaining. But okay. The first one is better. Like the second one, you can sit through and you won't be bored. And the first one, 
I don't know. The first one is just, yeah, it stands the test of time more, but the second one is more entertaining to watch. Um, but no, they're both terrific. And um, A Beautiful Mind, Rocky, a Platoon. Yeah, uh, so, and my number five was One Flew of the Cougar's Nest. So what's your number four? All right, my number four is Schindler's List. And it right, is... I'll jump in here. Oh, you're joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> this is having more common ground than I thought. Um... So, yeah. Schindler's List, released in 1993, is still the last time my favourite movie of a year won Best Picture in that year. <laughs> so, that's pretty crazy. Um, I don't agree with the Oscars too much. But, um, Schindler's List yeah. is about Oscar Schindler, who saved over a thousand Jews from the Nazis. Uh, and, you know, he, while they were working in his factory, and he saved them, you know, uh, with the cover of his factory and stuff. And it's been a good four years since I watched this. Like, it's one that... I just haven't gone back to because it has such a powerful emotional impact that I feel like that's going to fucking sustain me for a while. But I think it is coming up on the time where I need to watch it again. But it is a masterpiece. And if you don't tear up in that final scene where they're all putting the flowers on the grave, then you're you're a monster. That wasn't even the scene. I mean, I, I that's definitely where I teed up. But the first time was when... You know, he's at the car. When he's talking about how he could have got one more. This pen, that's three people. This is one more person. This car, that's five people. Why didn't I get more? It's really heartbreaking. Ben Kingsley is really great in it. Ray Fiennes and, of course, Liam Neeson. Uh, Who do you think think was more deserving of that Oscar that year? Tom Hanks, Philadelphia, Liam Neeson, Schindler's List. Mm. Well, it's been a very, very long time since I've watched Schindler's List, but um, Hanks is fantastic in Philadelphia. I I love... I might even say Hanks just. I can't say because it's been so long since I've watched Schindler's List. I couldn't really give you mm. <laughs> an accurate thing. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, no, they're, they're two. They would that. I mean, that would have been a battle for who was going to yeah. win. Like, yeah. two powerhouse performances, and this is a three-hour epic, three and a bit hours, uh, and it's so worth it. I mean, it just destroys you emotionally. You don't want to watch another film after it. You just want to sit and think about. And it's crazy to think that Steven Spielberg made Schindler's definitely List the Jurassic best the 1993 year, Spielberg films. movie. Yeah. All right, settle down. Um, yeah, so... By far. You're, so you're number three? I'm done. Yeah, I know. You're number three? Oh, my number three. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked, Jaron, because yeah. that's what I'm ready to talk about. Uh, my Ooh. number three is, and this is where our similarities end, I think, it's No Country for Old Men. Uh, big, 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 big fan of the Coens, and this is one of their best. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you mention it in your honorable mentions but um yeah no country for old man uh it's one of my favorite of the coma movies and you got josh brolin as Ellen moss and not lewin inside lewin Ellen moss lewin moss um yeah he stumbles upon some dead bodies in a briefcase with two million dollars in it and uh he takes it because you know why the fuck not and uh he finds himself at the mercy of a killer that's chasing him anton chigger played by Javier oh, about him a performance is that iconic, he won an oscar man. for chigger one I of the gr- i want to watch this again one of the greatest movie villains in the history of not just movie villains but villains in general look out hitler yeah um, hitler, you've chigger's got something <laughs> on you mate <laughs> yeah um, yeah, so he's kind of after him. He's got his, like, his gun thing that no one still really knows what it is. It's like an oxygen pump or a cattle prod or something. Like, I think it shoots out a metal thing that just stabs you in the head or something. Uh, it, it's, it's a weapon that you wouldn't think would be badass. He's just sort of... just blows out your head, doesn't he's it? Just, I think it's, like, really He's just sort of air or carrying around this oxygen tank looking thing and that's and it turned into one of them, oxygen. one of the scariest movie weapons ever. But just... It's such an anti-Western. It's so subtle and so not... It doesn't do... Every step of the way, it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. It do, Like, you know, from killing a major character off screen to ending on such a, you know, anticlimactic note where it's just, you know, and, and then I woke up. Uh, I think that's what he says. Tommy Lee Jones yeah. just talking about how he's... That's the theme of the movie. Like, I'm, I'm too old for this... Sh- Basically, the whole message of this movie is, I'm too old for this shit. Because yeah. <laughs> um, there's so much... Copy of Lethal Weapon. There's so much evil out there that you'll never be able to stop it. So it is kind of a nihilistic message in the end, but it's, it is such a great fucking movie. Jaron, your number three? I would love to go on to my number three. So, yeah, this is one that I didn't even see in your honorable mentions, but that's okay. I know you didn't love it as much as me. And uh, this is Barry Levinson's Rain Man. Now I like I, it. I really love this movie. 
I love Barry Levinson. Uh, he did Good Morning Vietnam, and that's a great film. Came on. And Rain Man is amazing. Um, so it's Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. They play Charlie and Raymond Babbitt, uh, respectively. They're brothers. Charlie Babbitt. And so Charlie Babbitt, Tom Cruise. Charlie Babbitt. Uh, he's uh, so he, he's Tom Cruise, and he's left a fortune. Uh, so his his father's died, and a fortune like their family's really rich. The fortune has been left to his autistic brother uh, Raymond, and I'm not saying that's not a uh, adjective. He's actually autistic. Um, and so, you know, Charlie's really pissed about that and he wants to make Raymond travel cross country so he can kind of sign these documents to get him to have this fortune. Um, and Raymond's not kind of sure what's going on. And this movie is great for so much reasons. First of all, it's an exploration of two brothers and this mental illness. And in America at the time, people didn't actually know people didn't uh, understand what autism, autism really was. Yeah. And this screenplay in this and movie, I'd argue that this day, it. these days people still don't understand it. Yeah, no, they don't. More people need to see Rain Man. Um, and it's amazing, you know, and uh, their exploration from when, you know... And, I mean, dude, who doesn't absolutely love Raymond Babbitt, man? Raymond, Rain Man is just so people amazing. Raymond, you know, uh, when Tom Cruise was a kid, he didn't know how to say Raymond, so he'd say <laughs> Rain Man. Um, and it's just so good, and they go bankrupt a casino together, and, you know, Tom Cruise, it's your classic, he learns to love him, but it's not <coughs> what it is, it's what it says, it's underneath, and it's so emotionally impactful, and at the very end, when, um, Dustin goes back to go to his home, because he wants to be closer to Kmart, that's not the actual reason, I just thought I'd say that, uh, you know, <laughs> Tom Cruise is like, I'll come visit you, man, and he's like, I'll come visit you, man, he's like, okay, Charlie, thank, 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 thanks, Charlie, um, <laughs> yeah. and he's like, it's like, that's alright, man, he's like, we can hug if you want, and he's like, Oh, okay, okay, Charlie. And they kind of hug, and then he lets him go. And it's just... I mean, he's so fragile. And Tom Cruise, by the end of it, just wants to protect him at all costs. When at the start, you know, he's he a didn't cinnamon even roll. really know he had a brother. And he's like, he's like, oh, I haven't seen him in so long. Do I really have to? And they really have all these memories. And yeah, it's um really, really great. And uh, Tom Cruise gets, you know, pissed at him at some moments because he doesn't really... He pisses on him at some either. moments. It's oh, crazy. Oh, yeah, you know, you know he it's does. But yeah, he doesn't really understand this disease either. And um, it's a really, yeah, it's, uh, as I said, it's an exploration into that. And uh, I really, really dug it. Jacob, your number deuce. My number two is a movie that you'll probably not find this high on anyone else's list ever, but it's a movie that's been special to me for a long time, and it's the reason I'm still somewhat excited for every movie Oliver Stone makes, and it's Platoon. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, most yeah. people don't seem to love this as much, but this is one of my all-time favourite war movies. It's one of my all-time favourite movies in general, and... It's just one that, it's another one that was one of the first movies I got into when I was getting into cinema, and I've just sort of had this connection with it, and uh, I've watched it a fair few times, and uh, Charlie Sheen is uh, Chris, like, you know, back when he wasn't a coked out maniac, Charlie Sheen I'd is... I'd argue he still was probably on coke. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Was, I don't know. Is this naive Vietnam recruit, Chris, and uh, it's basically just, there's no real plot. I mean, stuff happens along the way, and there's a conclusion and stuff, but really it's just a look at the horrors of war. And uh, some of his crewmates are some of the most memorable characters you could get. Mostly Barnes and Elias, played by Tom Berenger and Willem Dafoe. Willem Seriously, Dafoe. Tom Berenger as Barnes is one of my favourite villain performances ever. The only motherfucker who can kill Barnes is Barnes. He's got, like, <laughs> scars all over his face and shit, and he is just, like, he is pure evil. And Willem Dafoe is Elias, who's, like, the angel to his devil or whatever he's you know takes him under his wing a bit and stuff and you got a lot of people john c mcginley's there as this guy and he's like you know he's trying to get out of it but it's like like he's trying to sort of get himself home and they're like no you can't go home you have to fight this battle and he's like mm, i've got a bad fucking feeling about this johnny depp shows up for a little bit um as he did in a lot of 80s movies yeah, just showed up randomly <laughs> before he was a star <laughs> um all of the stones in it for a cameo too stink eye forest whitaker's in it um yeah it's <laughs> Yeah, but no, great, great cast. Lots of memorable scenes of them, like, hanging out uh, in their party, confrontations between Barnes and Chris and everything like that. And uh, I just love this, man. It's such a great look at the Vietnam War. And that scene, um, you know, the scene on the poster Ooh. where Elias is getting killed and the music yeah. of Dodgy for Strings is playing, uh, it's one of the most iconic moments in movie history. And, uh, yeah, I know most people wouldn't agree, but Platoon is a movie Dropping that thunder. is very special to me. Oh, yeah. Did you know that was Elias getting killed on the post before you saw the movie? Could you recognise the guy? Um, because you think that would give it away them that as the theatrical poster. I'm not sure, man. I was like fucking fourteen or fifteen when I watched it because it's one of my mum's favourite movies and she got me to watch it, so I probably didn't know. Yeah, I wonder if people back then did. 
Anyway, uh, so now we're coming on to my number two, and this is the last of my favourite movie of the year to win Best Picture, and it was 11 years ago, and this is Marty Scorsese's The Departed. That's my number one, so... So, yeah. what do you want to do? <laughs> we'll talk about it, because, yeah, all it's right, my number we'll one. we'll talk about it now. Uh, so, this is my favourite Marty movie. It's in my top ten movies of all time, and it's amazing. Let's talk about this cast. Vera Farmiga, Mark Wahlberg, Martin Sheen, Ray Winston, Jack Nicholson, Matt Damon, and Leo DiCaprio. I mean, it's Leo, all-star, man. It way to go. Huge. And this is the ultimate kind of... Because it's about gangsters, and it's also about corrupt cops. It's about... Uh, good and it's about Matt Damon up. calling firefighters a bunch of faggots. What more could you want? A bunch of hammers. Uh, Leo plays Billy Costigan Jr. as a uh, like a, as he works for the police, and he goes undercover in Jack Nicholson's Frank Costello's uh, kind of organization. Um, he doesn't know that, so he goes undercover for the police. Little does he know. Uh, Staff Sergeant Sullivan, played by Matt Damon, is actually uh, working for Jack Nicholson. He's one I love that opening scene. To him. I love that opening scene where it sets up kid. his relationship with Jack Nicholson and how how um, Nicholson sort of grooms him as a kid into joining their mob. He sort of becomes a father figure to him and everything. Yeah, and uh, there's just a lot of great scenes in that montage like when they're killing someone. He's like, huh, she fell she funny. Fell funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, um, so yeah, basically, uh, Leo is in the mafia, but works for the police, Matt Damon's in the police, works for the mafia, and they're both, uh, they both find out, like, the police and the mafia respectively find out that each other's got a rat, and they're tasked to go find them, and, um, so Leo's looking for Matt Damon, they're looking for each other, they cross paths a couple times, not Those knowing that silly scamps. It. Yeah, it's bloody amazing, man, this movie's two, almost, like, two hours and... Two and a uh, half. 30 minutes long, and you don't feel it at all. It's no, just, it's one of the most so entertaining movies it. ever made, in my opinion. It's my favourite Scorsese, and uh, I know that's probably blasphemy to some people, but, you know, I love this movie. Oh, Again... It's the only Scorsese movie to win Best Picture, so is that s- blasphemy? I can say this about almost all the movies in my five. It's one of the movies that shaped me as a film fan when I was first getting into them, and uh, as a guy who isn't huge on gangster movies, this is... My shit, man. I love it. It's so entertaining. And DiCaprio is amazing. Matt Damon. I want to see Matt Damon play more bad guys, man. And Mark, Marky fucking Mark, the man Oscar himself. nominated performance from Mark Wahlberg. He's great a lot of people as say, oh, Mark Wahlberg, he's kind of a joke. He's not that good an actor. Oh, look at the happening. Oh, look at Pain Again. Sure, he's got I'm looking at you, Ewan. Him, but, dude, he is so goddamn good in this movie and he's a great actor man the mm. real like the true life tra- tragedy trilogy he's great in he's great uh boogie but nights like, so many things he's great sergeant in, dignam this is his best in performance dignam yet. in this movie is just about the only good guy left and just about the real hero exactly. uh in in the end you know I he's would agree, yeah. he, he, he's brash and he's you know he gets on people's nerves and he makes enemies but he is dedicated to justice and yeah. that's what he gets at the end in that I incredible mean, final scene yeah, I mean, uh, even Leo's got a little bit of dirt on him, and, you know, he screws a girlfriend, who, a girl who he knew has a boyfriend, and Matt Damon, obviously, is a villain, because uh, he works for the Mafia, Jack Nicholson's a villain, too, but, yeah, Mark Warwick's the only, I mean, he acts like a brash asshole. like, he's so, f- he's he's so funny, man. <laughs> How are you? Tired from fucking your mother. How's your mother? Good, she's tired from fucking my father. <laughs> Jacob, if we were bad at our jobs, we would be cunts. Are you calling us cunts? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, no, maybe sir, not. not. Maybe fuck yourself. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any undercover right now? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. Like he's just so amazing. And um, but yeah, he really is dedicated to justice. And dude, at the end, without saying any words, you can tell he is so pissed about events that transpire oh, and deaths dude. that happen in this film, and it's heartbreaking in a way. And that final shot where it just cuts to the rat sitting on the edge the of the rat thing. Rat like, symbolizes Shipping up to Boston. Yeah, the Simpsons giving a little bit of shot there. Yeah, shipping up to Boston. Such a great soundtrack, such a great score, such a fantastic movie. And this is my number two and your number one. My number one, yep, that's it. That's it for me. Jaron, what's your number one? Numero uno, if you will. Do you have a guess at all? Any idea? Uh, all right, let me think. Let me just look through my list. Um, Forrest Gump, have you said that yet? Uh, yes. It is? Oh, oh you have said it already. 
No, I haven't said it. It's Forrest Gump. Yeah. Uh, this is <laughs> blasphemy to a lot of people because this has got so much backlash lately. Um, uh, unprecedented backlash, in my opinion. I mean, on Letterboxd, number but one guys, rating is but a But guys, five, but life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, I know the quote. I just you never know what you're going to get. Um, so everyone knows the story of Forrest Gump. You know, it's iconic. If you're a film fan, you've seen it probably. Uh, and Tom Hanks... Uh, in his Oscar-winning performance, two twice in a row, uh, he plays. Uh, he won an Oscar. He plays Forrest Gump, a man again with kind of a low IQ, not really autism, but you know he's not smart. And um, he's but he knows what love is. He does. He does, and he goes through life, uh, and he's and he's present during all these significant historic events. Like he meets three of the presidents, and by the third time, he's like, "I had to meet the president again. It was it was okay." And I'm like, "What?" And then it's him shaking Mr. Nixon's hand. I gotta pee. He, just, he, he just got pee. shot JFK. in the buttocks. He got shot in the ass. He was uh, he was the one who called um, the Watergate scandal on President Nixon. He was like, "Oh, someone's in that hotel room at night. Uh, you should go <laughs> check that out." Uh, he's just a Amazing, you know, he's a war hero, um, he's the number one ping pong player in the world, and yet despite all the things that he's attained, all these uh, life accomplishments, the one thing that's eluded him in, in, and the one thing he wants most is true love, he's infatuated with Jenny in an amazing performance by Robin Wright, who you know from House of Cards. She is amazing in Forrest Gump, and she plays this bitch, she's a dirtbag, she treats Forrest like shit. And he's too he's too dumb to understand that, but you know, he's loved her since he was five years old. He loves her so much and it's a story about a man who rises above his challenge and it just proves that, you know, determination, love it is and the ultimate courage. tale of being friend zoned. Yeah, love, courage and can you stop making jokes while I'm trying to talk about it, man? Love, <laughs> courage and determination. <laughs> it it's, it rises above just natural ability and he's yeah, he's he just he just wants love. He wants to love Robin Wright and uh who wouldn't want to love Robin Wright? Right. I mean, I actually think she's sexier as an old lady than she is now. Uh, than she yeah, is I'd, ra- I mean, I'd rather pretty... I'd rather current Robin Wright than fucking coked up hooker Jenny. Yeah, yeah, you need to see her. You need to watch House of Cards. It's so good. Yeah, Gary <laughs> Sinise is in this. Sally Field plays his mom, and she's and she is so good. Um, and that like, there's so many icon- iconic scenes. Uh, Robin Wright going, "Run, Forrest, run!" And then his braces break off his legs, and it's so good. To- and when he's playing football, and he's the fastest one on the field, no one can catch him. And they just give him the ball, and they're like, "Run, Forrest!" And he's like, "Okay!" And he just runs, and no one can catch him. He like runs through the field. He like runs. He into stra- into like a bunch of teenagers, into a bunch of cheerleaders, and then out of the field. And you know, oh, I got a million dollar wound. I don't know what they were talking about though. I ain't seen one cent of that million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and that uh, product placement, uh, Jenny got me a gift. Apparently, Nikes are the best gift in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant uh, just, Dan, ice and, cream! Yeah, <laughs> this is in my top four movies of all time because every time I get me, man, that end just gets me. I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen it for some reason, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, it, it just uh, something happens and he attains a lot of responsibility and then something else happens and it's delved on him and you realise that he and at the very last point which is a really underrated point is at the point where he's like He's talking to Robin Wright as an adult, and he realizes because we don't know that he knows he's dumb. Like we just think he knows he's a regular guy, and he's always like, "Oh, you know, why am I getting treated like shit?" You find out then that he knows that he isn't smart when he finds out. Spoiler alert! Um, skip to the end if you don't want to hear this. He has a child, and he's like, "Oh, is he smart like me? Is he yeah. smart, or is he like me?" And I'm like, that breaks my heart because he knows that he's he's he, Jaren, he knows that he's handicapped and it's really hard. We, yeah, we got two and a half minutes if we want to keep the show under an hour. I really miss you, Jenny. Um, I love Forrest Gump, and that's my top five list. All right, so uh, that is the and show mine. for today, Jacob. What do you think? If anyone cares, uh, it was a good show. It was just, don't. Um, it, probably the least material we've had for any show, and it still crept up to an hour. So um, you know, I don't mind it. I just I just want to get it done early so I can go watch Better Call Saul before I have to go out later. Not that you care about my personal life. Um, no, it's not even me. That's it from us. Thanks for watching, listening, whatever. Subscribe to us if you want more. Check, Check us, us out, out on Twitter. On Twitter. Children of Film. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> you owe me a soda. You didn't say it. Get wrecked. Uh, yeah, do all that kind of stuff. Like, comment, tell us your five favorite Best Picture winners. Um, and go back to a cod- couple podcasts ago where we did... Uh, we did our box office. Uh, box office predictions. Go put in your predictions because we'll read out the winner on the podcast. Um, later you win on nothing. We find out, but yeah, you, you know, win nothing, still, but you know, our respect. Um, and is that's that's give us really some more of those juicy, juicy comments and likes. 
Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Jaron. This is Jacob. I love film. He loves children, and we are children film. I had to let you get one in eventually. You did. Thanks, man. Thanks for that. Thanks for listening. Hey, Jaron, notice how I didn't prolong the ending by so long this time by continuing talking. I just ended it, and I kept it really short. You know what? I'm just going to keep rambling on until we get past an hour. How do you feel about that? Thanks for listening. <laughs> See ya. You've just listened to the Children of Film podcast. Man, it sucks to be you. 